Hello and welcome to the very first Mr. Carter Science Specials video. This video is for the Edexcel IGCSC Biology and or Double Science course. And today we'll be looking through the very first part of the syllabus, which is B1, the nature and variety of living things, otherwise known as classification. Before we get going, just a few study tips. On every single slide at the beginning of each section, you will see the syllabus references so you know what you will be expecting to learn. And I would also recommend that you listen carefully to this video, that you pause often, that you write notes and you attempt the review questions before then listening and correcting the review questions once I've gone through the answers with you. I hope you enjoy this. Please like and share it and post in your comments below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so that you hear the when the latest video is being released. So classification. Classification means putting living things into groups based on their characteristics. And scientists have been doing this for a very long time and arguing as part of sciences and discussing and coming up with a list of characteristics which all scientists agree with for each particular group. The very largest group that you can possibly have is all living organisms. So how is it that a scientist will classify an organism as being living or perhaps non-living? Well, if we take you all the way back to year seven, perhaps you'll remember Mrs. Gren. Some teachers will call it Mrs. Nerg. I prefer Mrs. Nerg for an obvious reason you'll see in a minute. But Mrs. Gren or Mrs. Nerg. If you're a living thing, you will carry out all seven life processes. And they are movement, respiration, sensitivity, nutrition, excretion, reproduction, and growth. Respiration, you may remember, is a chemical reaction that happens in all living cells, whereby they take some glucose, join it with some oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, and water with some energy released in the form of ATP. Sensitivity, all living things can sense the environment around them. In animals we have our five senses, sight, taste, hearing, touch and smell, but all living things have a variety of senses. A bacteria, for example, can sense its environment and be able to know to move towards oxygen or towards nutrients. Plants, for example, can also sense the light. They will know when to open or close their stomata. All living things will need some nutrition and nutrients in a variety of different forms. And of course, once you've had those nutrients and use them in a variety of chemical reactions in your cells, you will produce some waste which you will then need to get rid of, and that's known as excretion. So first you have your nutrients, then your excretion, which is why I prefer this particular order. And finally, we have reproduction, where you're making copies of yourself and growth. Once you've reproduced, your offspring will need to grow to maturity. One other thing to take notice of are the viruses. Now, viruses are not living things because they do not do all seven life processes. For example, they don't respire, they don't grow, and they don't take in any nutrients. Also, viruses are incredibly small, much smaller than cells. They're only made out of a small section of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a protein coat. So if you can do all seven life processes, you are a living organism. But that's obviously a very, very big group. So how is it scientists can then classify this? Into well, before we go on and look at that, we need to remind ourselves of some key terms. And key terms, again, going back to year seven about the cell. So you may remember in year seven that you looked at animal cells and plant cells. Animal cells and plant cells all have a nucleus. 
which contains DNA and controls the functions of a cell. They all have some cytoplasm in them, which is where chemical reactions will happen, and they all have a cell membrane which controls what goes in and out of the cell. However, plant cells will also have a cell wall, which provides support, and in a plant cell, these are made out of cellulose. They'll also have a chloroplast, which contains a green pigment called chlorophyll, and this is where photosynthesis occurs. And they'll have a large vacuole, which contains sap and sugars. Now, these particular parts of the cell are very important because the scientists, they classify the largest possible groups of living things based on what their cells look like. Now, the largest possible groups that we have, the very beginning group, when you take all your living things, all those organisms, we can split that into two groups. And those two groups are based on one simple thing. Do you have a nucleus in your cell? Or do you have no nucleus? So those two groups are called the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes based on cells and whether you have a nucleus or not. This very first division is known as the domains. Each domain can then be broken down into smaller and smaller groups. The next level of groups are called kingdoms. So let's take a look at the different kingdoms. So here we have a diagram showing us how living organisms are classified into domains and kingdoms. First of all, we have our two domains at the top here. The eukaryotes, which have no nucleus, and the prokaryotes, which have a nucleus. The next level down are called the kingdoms. And we actually have four kingdoms in the eukaryotic um, domain, plants, animals, fungi, and protosis. And the prokaryotes only have one kingdom, which is the prokaryotic kingdom. So that's a total of five kingdoms. We're now going to look at each kingdom one at a time to see what characteristics an organism must have in order to be classified into that kingdom. So the first kingdom we'll look at are the prokaryotes. These are microscopic, single-celled organisms. They have a cell wall, a cell membrane, a cytoplasm. They also have plasmids, which are circular little bits of DNA. They do not have a nucleus, and that's the most important thing that defines a prokaryote. A single-celled organism with no nucleus. They do, however, contain circular chromosomes of DNA. Occasionally, some bacteria are photosynthetic and able to carry out uh, photosynthesis. And most of these prokaryotic bacteria will feed off living or dead organisms. As I've already mentioned, all bacteria fit into this particular category, including lactobacillus, which is a rod-shaped bacterium used in the production of milk. And we also have pneumococcus, a spherical shaped bacterium that acts as a pathogen, a disease causing microbe. Let's just remind ourselves of that definition. A disease causing microorganism. And that causes a disease, pneumonia. Now it's very important you can give at least two examples for each of the kingdoms. So lactobacillus, Bulgariceus, which is used for making yogurt, very important for us, and also pneumococcus, which causes pneumonia. The very next kingdom we're going to look at are the protosis. It's got an unusual spelling, so please take some time and practice this particular spelling. P-R-O-T-O-C-T-I-S-T-S. Again, these are a single-celled microorganism, and again, they have a cell wall. So how exactly can you differentiate them from prokaryotes? Well, the most important thing is that these protocysts are eukaryotic, and they have a nucleus. 
So if you have a single celled organism that has a nucleus, it will be a protocyst. And again, let's think of some examples. Amoebas that live in pond water. They have very, features very similar to animal cells. You could have cholerea, uh, chorelella, chorelella, which have chloroplasts and are far more like plants. And we also have some pathogens, again, disease causing microorganisms, in particular plasmodium, which is the pathogen responsible for causing malaria. And here you can see some red blood cells. And these little shapes inside the red blood cells here are actually the plasmodium protocyst, which causes malaria. Next kingdom we're going to look at are the fungi. Now, fungi cannot carry out photosynthesis. It was a long time ago. Scientists thought that fungi might perhaps be classified as plants, but they are not able to carry out photosynthesis. So we no longer put them in that kingdom. They have a kingdom all on their own. So fungi can be either single celled, for example, yeast, or multicellular, for example, this particular fungi, muco. So their body is usually organized into a mycelium made from thread-like structures called hyphae. These are the little hyphae here. Their cell walls, though, and this is the most important thing, their cell walls are made of a substance called chitin. I know it's spelt chitin, but we say chitin. So if you have a single cell or a multicell which has a nucleus and a cell wall made out of chitin, and you know that you have a fungi. Fungi are described as being saprophytic feeders. And this means that they release digestive enzymes into the environment, onto their food. The enzymes will break down their food and allow the fungus cells to absorb through diffusion and active transport all of the food molecules they need. These food molecules, particularly the carbohydrates, are stored as something called glycogen. And this is very similar to animal cells. So the plant kingdom. Now plants are multicellular organisms, unlike the other three kingdoms. And their cells contain not only a nucleus, because they are eukaryotic, but also, most importantly, chloroplasts. And chloroplasts contain a green pigment chlorophyll and allow plants to carry out photosynthesis and therefore make their own glucose, carbohydrates. And the car glucose and carbohydrates they will store as starch or sucrose. And this again differentiates them from fungi. Another thing that differentiates and sets them apart from fungi is that plants have cellulose in their cell walls, not chitin. So again, we can look at the cell wall of plants and fungi cells to be able to identify the differences between them. And finally, animals. Animals are multicellular organisms. Again, they have a nucleus because they are eukaryotic. They do not contain chloroplasts, and they cannot photosynthesize, and they do not have cell walls. So animal cells are very easy to identify because they only actually have three parts of their cell. The nucleus, the cell membrane, and the cytoplasm, where all those chemical reactions happen, chemical reactions like respiration. They do have carbohydrates within their cells, often glucose, but that glucose is used up straight away in respiration. If they need to store any carbohydrates, just like fungi, they will store them as a chemical called glycogen. So examples would include insects, houseflies, mosquitoes, fish, jellyfish. There's a very large amount of different animals in the kingdom. And finally, viruses. Viruses are only here for completeness sake. They are not living organisms, as we've already stated. Viruses are not cells. They're much, much smaller than cells and much smaller even than bacteria cells. They're very, very simple. They only contain an outer layer of a protein coat with some DNA or RNA inside the protein coat. Parasites are always parasitic, which means that they live off another host, stealing their nutrients, and they need the host cells in order to be able to reproduce. So some examples include the tobacco mosaic virus, 
that infects the leaves of tobacco plants, one of the most studied viruses there is. Um, and also the two that we've got here are bacteriophage, these are the kind of bat viruses that will infect bacteria cells, and then one of the most common viruses that infects humans, the influenza viruses. Now viruses are always pathogens because they always, always, always cause disease. So let's have a little review. I recommend now that you pause the video and try out this question. See if you can say fill in with missing gaps using all, some or none. So let's have a look at the answers. We'll start by going across each particular row. So fungi, only some fungi are multicellular. All the cells have a nucleus and none of the cells have chloroplasts. All the cells have cell walls. Most cell walls are made out of chitin. With bacteria, none of the cells are multicellular. None of the cells have a nucleus, but some of the cells can contain chloroplasts, or at least are photosynthetic, and all of the bacteria cells or pro prokaryotic cells have cell walls. With a protocyst, none of them are multicellular. All protocysts have a cell wall. Some contain chloroplasts and all have a cell wall. Apologies, that should have been all have a nucleus here. Try these questions now, pause the video and have a think about these questions. So describe how a typical plant cell differs from a typical animal cell. Classic question this, and you need to be saying that plant cells have chloroplasts, cell wall, and a large vacuole. Animal cells do not have these features. Give one way in which the structure of a virus differs from the structure of a bacterium. Again, think about the structure of a bacterium. Bacteria have a cell wall. Bacteria have a cell membrane. You can pick any one of these. Bacterial cells have a plasmid. You could say that viruses do not have a cell wall, do not have a cell membrane. Viruses only contain a protein coat called a capsid. Question three, explain why viruses are not classified as living things. And this is relatively simple because viruses are not classified as living things because they do not do all seven life processes. And just as one example, they do not respire. Respiration. clean this up a little bit. So describe how a typical plant cell differs from a fungi cell. Well here we need to be thinking largely about two things. We need to think about a cell wall and then a plant cell. Plant cell wall is made out of cellulose. Put in the fungi cell wall. That would be chitin. And we could talk about plant cells have chloroplasts. But fungi do not have chloroplasts. And we should be able to easily answer question five, name the part of a yeast cell that's made of chitin. Well, yeast is a type of fungus. Chitin is only found in cell walls. So the answer there is the cell wall. Name the carbohydrate stored in the cytoplasm of the yeast cell. And that carbohydrate will be glycogen. How did you do? If you managed to get all six questions correct, then you're doing very well so far. So the next few slides are going to be about taxonomic groups. We've already mentioned that the largest possible group is a group we call a domain. 
and then in your specification we're looking largely then at kingdoms and we've gone through the five different kingdoms that there are but how can we remember the order of all the other groups that there are the smaller groups as you go below kingdoms and you keep getting smaller and smaller well we've got a, a team here who are playing cricket and this particular team is the Kent County cricket team in the south of England so one of the ways that we can try and remember these the correct order is asking a question do Kent play cricket on a firm grass surface that question is a mnemonic it allows us to remember domains the next largest group kingdoms and then slightly smaller phylums class orders families and then finally genus and species these two are particularly important because these are our binomial names or latin names binomial names and every single species will be given by scientists a binomial name consisting of the genus or genre and the species so let's look at an example of this there's a very nice youtube video that you can have a look at here uh, which will let's go through this a little bit more detail and that would be looking at classifying lions so lions are in the kingdom of animalia that's the animal kingdom to you and me, but scientists will often use a Latin term. So lions are in the kingdom Animalia, the phylum Chordata, the class of Mammalia, which means they're mammals, the order of Carnivora, the family of Felidae, and then finally, the genus is Panthera leo. So the binomial name or the Latin name of a lion is the Panthera leo. And this is very, very important because this whole system was decided by Carl Linnaeus. He was a Swede born in 1707 and he realised there was a particular problem. And this is the problem here. Have a look at this plan. It's a traditional treatment for epilepsy. So for hundreds of years, scientists have studied this plan to try and find out which particular chemical in this plant is effective in treating epilepsy. But scientists have had a problem. Even in England, it has four different names. Do you call it water hyssop? Do you call it the herb of grace? One scientist might be studying the herb of grace and another scientist studying water hyssop. Without you knowing that they are the same plant, you might never share your work and you may never be able to collaborate and come to a scientific conclusions and make breakthroughs together. It gets even more um, difficult when you start to look at some of the names that it uses abroad. Barami, for example, Bengsaga. So, Carl Linnaeus realised we needed a system to standardise this. And that's the system we've just been studying, where he looked at the hierarchy of different animals and different organisms. People can get kingdom at the top and go all the way down to genus and species at the bottom. So, if we look at an example here of three very similar organisms. We've got obviously a tiger, a lion, and a cheetah. They all look very, very similar. They are all in the Panthera genus because they've got the same genus. They've got the same basic characteristics, so they end up in the same genus. However, they have different species. For example, apologies, this is actually a jaguar. So we have Panthera tigris, which is the tiger, Panthera leo is the lion, and Panthera onca is the jaguar. All very, very similar organisms, but by using their binomial Latin names, we can begin to tell them apart and identify them, and classify them better. So let's have a couple of examples of these binomial names. This first one, Raphlesia arnoldi is the largest flower in the world its flowers can reach over a meter across it's found in malaysia and indonesia in the jungles of borneo and sumatra but what's the genus what's the species here we've got a tarantula lasiodora parahibana again what's the genus what's the species pause the video have a think can you fill in the gaps So hopefully you've filled in the gaps and you found that the genus of the flower is Raphalesia and the species is Alnaldi. 
But notice this, if ever you're typing these, you need to use italics to denote that it is a binomial name. And more than that, you need to always use a capital letter for the genus and a lowercase letter for the species. And this is the same with our tarantula. tarantula. The genus Lassiodora gets the capital letter and the species Parabana gets the lowercase letter. Here's a few other examples. Again, pause the video, give them a try. So the genus for the white rhino is Diceros and the species Bicornis. And this particular species, very nice on your fish and chips, is a cod. And the genus is Gadus and the species is Mohua. So once again, pause the video, try these review questions. I'll give the answers on the next slide. And here are your answers. So, mucor belongs to the fungi kingdom. A lactobacillus is a bacteria and therefore part of the prokaryote kingdom. And Corella and amoeba are both protocysts. Which kingdom do bacteria belong to? Explain your answer. Our well, bacteria are all single celled organisms with no nucleus therefore they must belong to the prokaryote kingdom compare and contrast the structures and features of viruses and bacteria well, again we want to be talking about bacteria having cell walls having cell membranes cytoplasm which viruses do not but you could then talk about viruses viruses only having some nucleic acid and a protein coat and the protein coat is called the capsid Name four structures found in a bacterium that are not found in a virus. Well, I think we've covered all of that already. Bacteria and viruses can both be pathogenic. Define the term pathogen. And that is a disease causing microorganism. Give examples of diseases caused by viruses. Well, there's a lot of these that we could go through. Um, the coronavirus, for example, COVID-19, the influenza uh, viruses, HIV viruses, tobacco way of say it viruses. There's a large number of different viruses. And similarly, there's a large number of bacterial diseases, the bubonic plague, for example, um, pneumonia that we've mentioned caused by the pneumococcus bacteria, tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria, um, something as simple as a sore throat caused by streptococcus is also um, caused by bacteria. So there's a large number of different examples you may have gone for. I hope this video has been useful. Please add comments to the comment section and don't forget to subscribe so that you get notifications of when the next video is due out. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.